The Camargue is situated in the Rhone Delta, tucked between the two branches of the river and the Mediterranean to the south. Flat country and lots of water melds itself with the sky. The Camargue's particular character has been forged by man and the river over the centuries. Fifty percent of the cultivatable land produces rice. The lakes produce fish and the salt flats cover a greater area than the entire city of Paris. The natural reed is one of the characteristics of the Camargue. The annual harvest is economically important. Bonjour. Good morning. You have to use the point. We are coming to the end of the season because you can see the new reeds growing. How many years have you done that? Since I was born, practically. How many packets do you do a day? That depends. If it's fine, three or four hundred. If it's bad weather, it depends. If the reeds aren't any good, more or less, it depends. It's very difficult to say. How do you gauge the amount for each bundle? Under the arm, I'm used to doing that. Is that the Mistral? No, 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 the Mistral comes from the other direction. This is the wind from the sea. We start cutting in December when the leaves are fallen. And we finish about April the 15th. We go on collecting the reeds until the end of July. Today cutting the reeds by hand is being replaced by huge machines specially constructed for this kind of harvest. Reeds are a product that are both hard and soft, rigid and supple, and easy to handle. Today, reeds are used for thatching and for matting in agriculture. Most of the production finds its way to the north of Europe.
Founded in 1874, the Pierre family business produces natural reeds of the Camargue. At the beginning they made mats but went on to make traditional Camargues roofs and have developed a large range of other products like beach umbrellas, beach cabins, reed screens, all in the traditional Camargue style. The permanent population of pink flamingos, the emblem of the Camargue in the Rhone Delta, is about five to six thousand. The color of their feathers comes from eating the Artima salina, a small shrimp which is their basic diet. Fishing in the lakes and canals of the Camargue is a very ancient business and is practiced by a handful of professionals. Fishermen can be found on the lakes of Imperio and Malargua and on the edges of the lake of Vacares. Here it's mostly eels. There are some salmon. I eat those myself. There are carp. Why do you work with this kind of boat? First, because they are practical, they have flat bottoms and float in very shallow water. They are propelled by a pole called a parpège. As we work in protected sites, they are ideal. They don't sink and they work well. You see here, we have a net which we call a paradia for catching eels. There are nets attached to a fixed post. The fish are steered in by the wing of the net and finish up in the middle. I shall go to the central part where in principle there are generally more fish. There's fish and plenty of it for once. The fish goes in and it's in prison. Usually it can't get out. There are a few carp in this lot, which you see I throw back. Today there isn't a market, so I leave them. Try not to damage them, and the strong ones leave. That's a perch. It has a lot of colors. A little carp, a small shrimp, which we throw back in the water. Here are some eels of a good size. In this lake there are always very good fish. Now we shall look at the secondary net where there are generally a lot less fish than the main net.
We should get to the second, the second net. You have pink flamingos round the edge. When there are too many, it creates an imbalance. It's true that we have to protect them, but we mustn't let it go too far in the wrong direction. For the last hundred years or so, since they started to canalize the road, they have gradually blocked the freshwater entrances. So the eel culture is essentially regulated today by sluices and pumps, which stops the young eels getting in. So if the young eels arrive when the pump is off and the sluices are open, they get in. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them. The nets are dirty, so there are fewer fish. We are coming up to the full moon and we catch less at night. More for the fish than the eels. They can see clearly and they pay attention. It's a bit like that in the day. It's a wild fish. They come in as young transparent eels and they fatten in the lakes. And when they've got to the right size in October to November, they try to leave for the sea to reproduce. The best period is the autumn for the silver eel. It's then you get the best fish, when the eel is ready to leave. That's when you get the best fish. October to November, a month, a month and a half. That's the best period for the fish. An average fisherman who fishes eels all the year round, I think, will catch between three or four tons of eels on average. That's not very much, a bit more depending on the place. So he has to do other things if he's going to live all year round. Ah, there's a bit. A crayfish.
There, we'll use a net to keep them alive. When there are enough, a lorry comes to collect them. It's vital they stay alive, otherwise they lose their value. That's a little fish. That's very good. I've sorted them into two different lots. Those will be taken for fattening and those will be sold directly. When there is bad weather, I have to come here to take out the nets and clean them. And afterwards, because of the bad weather, I don't have time to catch good fish. One has to work whatever. It's difficult, but somehow one gets there. The carp are excited because it's the moment. It's the moment for reproduction. It's the moment they couple. Is that a freshwater lake? Yes, exactly. It's a freshwater lake where we visited the nets just now. We work there from March to July, and in a very short distance, the water becomes salty and the vegetation becomes tufty. And we work on this lake and on the sea from September to December. And what do you fish here? We fish as well as eels, grey shrimps, because the water is salty, and the terrine, which is a kind of smelt, which is fried. And then there are sea fish like sole, sea bass, silverfish and mullet. There are years when there are more or less. It depends on the exchange between the lakes and the sea. We have a difference in the vegetation here in the Camargue. Reeds, and like I said just now, and tamarisk. And there are huge clumps of saltwort, weeds and essential herbs, which grow in salt water, which are able to absorb lots of water to carry them through the dry months. This type of vegetation is special to this area. It's an extraordinary countryside here. Yes, it's a little odd, and it's an exceptional biotype. Some say the horse of the Camargue is descended from the horse of the steppes of Central Asia, but legend has it he was a gift from Neptune. Man's faithful companion, he shares with him the needs of every day. Here you have horses of one, two and three years. At one year we just tie them up in the stable so that they respect man. At two years we run them with a girth or a little saddle or a thing like that. At three years we start to work them with everything. Go Musepa, you're going to show them. 
Otro. 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 Allez, canta. Vous voyez Look how it changes its legs. Oui, oui, oui. See his forward left foot, see his inside left, he's in front of his inside right. So as we say, he's on the right foot. Trot, trot. Walk. The Camargue horse is a very tough animal which allows it to live free outdoors all the year round. It's adapted itself to the Savoy, even Belgium, the north of France, everywhere. It is a horse once it's been broken that is an all purpose horse. It's a horse which isn't good at jumping, but even so, it can jump over 1.3 meters. It's a horse that you can put in harness. It's a horse you can tour on. It's an all purpose horse. It's a horse which we use above all others for working the bulls and things like that. And intelligent as well. Very intelligent, but you need to be in charge of it. You have to be gentle but firm. If you do, then it will respect you and everything will go very well. You mustn't let it be in charge. You have to be coaxing and firm at the same time. Me, I live on vines and wheat, but horses, that's another thing. It's a passion that doesn't make money. If I lived on horses, I wouldn't have a car, just a little bike. <laughs> you want to keep the breed as a rustic horse, truly rustic. Outside all the year round, it has no food additives except grass. It's always the earth that makes the animal. If the Camargue horse is like that, it's because of the soil. It has large hooves for walking in muddy ground, a white coat for the sun, and that's been going on for generations. So this is a herd of mares and their foals. They're there only to bring up their foals. This year's foal is waiting to be born. The mares eat what they want. They do nothing else. They look after their foals till they're weaned. In this herd, there are mares that which are suckling their foals, and there are mares with their foals who will be pregnant next year. One year they foal, the next they rest. So they only bring up one foal at a time. One in the stomach, one underneath. So I put the stallions with the mares in the year they haven't had a foal. They are covered and they are pregnant for the next year. We put the mares in the field with the stallions in complete freedom. We do not have the right in the Camargue for artificial insemination or other similar means. We are obliged to leave the stallions free. The stallion is left with the herd. Of course, we leave the mares with the right stallion. Here there are a herd of spring mares, and we put the stallion to work with the mares it wants. But he always falls on his feet, it's nature. Even with the birth of the foal, there's no help from the vet, there's nothing. Often when one arrives in the morning, the foal is born, completely naturally.